Thank you, Matt, and uh, praise team for that uh, time of worship together. Again, it's always such a blessing to be able to sing uh, praises and worship songs to our Savior, Jesus. Just want to give you a quick update. My, uh, my brother Dave and, and his wife Becky and their kids, they will be uh, leaving Florida next week. So they'll be making the trip out here. Um, they, still, um, they still haven't sold their home yet, so that's a big deal. Um, so I know many of you are praying, so pray that as they transition, um, that the Lord would give them peace, that they would also sell their home. Uh, we have worked out arrangements uh, for them to stay at a home um, uh, rent-free for uh, as long as it takes to sell their home. So God provided in that way, as He always does. But um, next week, they'll be out here. Um, of course, uh, He won't start uh, leading us in worship until uh, September, but they're making that trip, I believe, I believe it's Wednesday. Okay? So you can be praying for them. We're excited. Um, they're excited too. They're, um, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to um, keep it together, not selling their home and, and you know, unsure of what's going to happen with that. But, you know, just like we, we sang, you know, God's ways are not our own, and so we just have to trust Him. And that's, that's what they're doing right now. They're walking by faith. So um, we're excited about what, what God is going to do. Um, at this time, we're going we're gonna to be in the Word of God, so hopefully you brought your Bible with you. You can get it out, open it up to Mark chapter 2. Okay, if you don't have a Bible, um, chances are you can pull one up on your phone. Um, phone Bibles count, okay? Um, you can take one uh, from the pew in front of you, okay? Get a Bible in your hand, Mark chapter 2. And uh, we're going to finish this chapter this morning. Uh, Mark, of course, is one of four Gospels, okay? One of four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These four Gospels give us both a bi biography and theology, uh, biography and theology. The four Gospels give the historical uh, account or record of Jesus' life and ministry, while at the same time revealing the divine qualities of Jesus so that we, the readers, can walk away knowing that Jesus is indeed the Son of God and the Savior of the world. In fact, Mark comes right out of the gate in his Gospel uh, by saying in chapter 1, verse 1, that Jesus is the Son of God. In chapter 1, verse 3, Jesus is called the Lord. In chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus is described as the beloved Son of the Father. In chapter 1, verse 24, Jesus is referred to as the Holy One of God. And then in chapter 2, in Mark chapter 2, Jesus proved He is all of those titles by, uh, you know, casting a demon out of a man in the synagogue, by rebuking a high fever out of Peter's mother-in-law, by healing a man with leprosy in Capernaum, by healing a paralytic and forgiving his sin in, in, in Peter's house. Those works confirmed Jesus' words. Okay, those miracles validated Jesus' message. They proved convincingly that Jesus is the Son of God, worthy of all praise, honor, and glory. Here in Mark chapter 2, verses 23 through 28, we see another title that rightly belongs to Jesus. It's the title, the Lord of the Sabbath. The Lord of the Sabbath. And by giving himself that title, Jesus infuriated the Pharisees, right? The Pharisees who thought they were in charge of the Sabbath. Well, Jesus, of course, was right. The Pharisees were wrong. Jesus embodied the truth. The Pharisees embodied a false religion, a, a works-based system. And, and so Jesus came right out and called the Pharisees what they were. He said that they were false teachers who led their followers straight into the pit of hell. The Pharisees called themselves holy, Jesus called them phony. The Pharisees hated Jesus. With every miracle Jesus performed, their hatred grew hotter, and with every message Jesus preached, their hearts grew harder. The Pharisees hated the fact that Jesus uh, w would eat with sinners and tax collectors. In fact, the Pharisees labeled Jesus a friend of sinners, which was a title intended to destroy Jesus' character and reputation. And Jesus responded by saying, you know what, that's great because I've come to call sinners, not those who think they're righteous. Jesus came to save the repentant unrighteous, 
not the unrepentant self-righteous. So, you know, tax collectors and sinners like Matthew, they were in, and people like the Pharisees were out. And the Pharisees hated Jesus for that, and their hatred is going to rise to a fever pitch right here in this passage when Jesus calls himself the Lord of the Sabbath. By claiming that title for himself, Jesus was declaring his rule, his authority over the Pharisees' works-based system called Judaism. All right, listen, the Sabbath was pretty much the Pharisees' favorite day because that day, more than any other day, was where they could showcase their strict spirituality and their moral superiority. Which, by the way, the, the Sabbath day, um, that was one of God's Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. Right? You know this. And in verse 8, I believe, of Exodus 20, God said, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. God said that. God ordained and orchestrated the Sabbath. And so for Jesus to say, I am the Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus is saying he's God. Okay, that is a clear claim to deity. The Pharisees knew what Jesus was saying, and so they thought Jesus was a blasphemer. You know, in John chapter 5, we're told that the Pharisees were seeking to kill Jesus because he was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. And and the Pharisees hated Jesus to the point of wanting to kill him. Why? Because, again, he said he was equal with God. And secondly, it's because Jesus refused to adhere to all their man-made, legalistic, extra-biblical Sabbath day rules. Okay, Jesus rejected Judaism while claiming deity, and that set the Pharisees off. The Pharisees, here's what it came down to. The Pharisees were jealous because Jesus was the real deal and they were a bunch of religious phonies. And from our text, we're going to learn some characteristics of religious phonies. All right, so pay attention here. Uh, Here's the first one. Religious phonies elevate their traditions over God's truth. Religious phonies elevate their traditions over God's truth. All right, look at verse 23. This is where we left off last time. Uh, One Sabbath, that word Sabbath, the Hebrew word is Shabbat. It means to stop and rest, cease and desist. Uh, This comes from Genesis chapter 2 when God rested on the seventh day after creating the universe in six days. The Sabbath is a day of rest. And, and so from the pattern of Genesis 2, the Jews on, on the seventh day of each week, they were to stop and rest. Why? In order to focus on their relationship with God. That's why. No work, no meetings, no deadlines. Just pause, pause, and be refreshed by deepening your relationship with the Lord. Now, This was a command, okay? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It was given to Moses by God for the people. And so, in the time of Jesus, 15 centuries had passed since God wrote out that command on those stone tablets for Moses. And over those 15 centuries, the scribes and the rabbis, they added all these additional rules about what you could and could not do on the Sabbath. Now, God just said, remember the Sabbath. That's it. Set aside a day, stop your work, rest, and focus on me. But all the religious leaders, like the Pharisees, they decided to have the final say on what does and does not count as work. So they came up with this this big, long list. Okay, everybody say, not in the Bible. Not about this list was extra biblical and it included categories from eating to spitting. If you were a writer, the Pharisee said, You cannot carry a pen on the Sabbath, that's work. If you were a seamstress, the Pharisee said, You cannot carry a needle on the Sabbath, that's work. If you were a student, the Pharisee said, You cannot carry a book on the Sabbath, that's work. The Pharisee said that, that on the Sabbath, if you carried anything that weighed more than a dried fig, you were working and therefore breaking God's commandment. You know how much a dried fig, one dried fig weighs? 0.5 ounces. So one pound is 16 ounces. On the Sabbath, the Pharisee said anything over half an ounce, 
You better not pick it up because you'll be a lawbreaker. It's so stupid. So if you picked up an object, you know, weighing 0.5 ounces or less, of course, and, and you were to toss that object up into the air, the Pharisees said that you had to catch it with the same hand you tossed it with because if you used your other hand, that's work and therefore a direct violation of God's law. Where is that in the Bible? Where is it in the Bible? It's not there. If a bug was in your house on the Sabbath, an insect was crawling around your home on the Sabbath, you better leave it alone because stepping on uh, the bug and crushing it is work. And if you were to do that, then not only are you cruel to insects, but you're a lawbreaker. You couldn't light a bonfire on the Sabbath. You couldn't even light a candle on the Sabbath because then you'd have to extinguish it, and that's work. Again, keep in mind, God's never said any of this stuff. It was all the Pharisees. You couldn't take a bath on the Sabbath. No cleaning yourself because you might spill some water on the floor and then you got to wipe it up and that's work. No work on the Sabbath. Pharisees said you couldn't, you couldn't boil an egg on the Sabbath. It's too much work. If you were sick on the Sabbath, you better hope you could hold on for 24 hours because you're not supposed to receive treatment on the Sabbath. That's work. Ladies, no looking in the mirror on the Sabbath. Because if you did, you might notice a gray hair and then you'd be tempted to pluck it. No plucking gray hairs on the Sabbath. That's work, so put the mirror down. For sure, no jewelry on the Sabbath. It weighs more than a dried fig. So what I should do, really, is I should take my watch off, set it over here, and maybe I'll finish my sermon on time. I don't know. I don't have my watch. Listen, those are just some of the rules and regulations the Pharisees added to God's law. None of this came from God's mouth. None of their rules were truth. It was their tradition that they elevated as truth. And so this account in Mark chapter 2, verses 23 through 28, it takes place on the Sabbath, the day where God said, take time to rest and be refreshed by me. That's all. Just, just stop and worship. But, but the Pharisees held everybody to this, to this hyper-religious, superficial, legalistic standard. No bathing, no lifting, no plucking, no cooking, no nothing. Don't do anything. Just sit there and shut up. I had, a, I had a roommate in college who had a friend who grew up in an environment where he and his family adhered to all those man-made, extra-biblical, Sabbath-day rules, and whenever this guy would come and visit my roommate, I got to tell you, it was miserable. He just sat in the dorm room all weekend and did nothing. I told my roommate, let me know when your friend's coming in because I'm going home that weekend. We couldn't go to the gym, we couldn't walk to the cafeteria, we couldn't go out to eat. Well, we could, but, but this guy said he couldn't. And so I was like, who says you can't? God never did. So Mark 2, 23 through 28, what day is it? Sabbath day, back to verse 23. One Sabbath, he, Jesus, was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, so here's another stupid restriction the Pharisees mandated, you couldn't travel on the Sabbath, right? The furthest you were allowed to venture from your home was 3,000 feet or 1,999 steps. They counted it all out. Do we see any of that in Exodus chapter 20? Did, did God put a limit on how many steps you were allowed to take on the Sabbath? Yes or no? No. Okay, so if you want to get in your 10,000 steps, feel free. Your, your Fitbit watch is okay on the Sabbath. If you lived in Bible times and you showed up to the synagogue to worship, but you had to take 2,000 steps to get there, the Pharisees wouldn't even let you in the door. You're a lawbreaker. Reminds me of an early memory I have of the church I grew up in. There was this visitor who showed up one Sunday morning. It was, it was her first time there ever. She was wearing not the most modest outfit, right? It wasn't terrible, but whatever, she's a visitor. Probably never been to church, certainly not ours. And, and so she sits down, 
in, in one of the pews, she sits down in some cruel, cranky, crusty Pharisee in the church went up to that visitor and asked her to leave. I was like, I was like 10 years old at the time, and even at that age, I knew that was so wrong. And I, I wanted to go Jason Bourne all over that guy for what he did to that lady. Guess what, though? We, we never saw her again. We never saw her again. Pharisees are brutal. Brutal. Don't even bother going to the synagogue to worship. If you've got to travel more than 3,000 feet to get there, the Pharisees will turn you around and send you home. So one Sabbath, verse 23, one Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as they, Jesus and his disciples, made their way, guys, they were traveling on the Sabbath. Everybody go, <gasps> wait, 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 let me give you the cue, all right? One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, you guys are all Pharisees, all, because that's how a Pharisee would react. You're wearing jeans to church? <gasps> You're playing drums in church? <gasps> You're having fun in church? <gasps> Jesus, you and the disciples are walking on the Sabbath? <gasps> and not only that, not only were they going through the grain fields, making their way, look at what else they were doing. The end of verse 23, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. So if the Pharisees said, you can't pluck your eyebrows on the Sabbath, how do you think they're going to react to plucking heads of grain? Give me the reaction. <clears throat> the Pharisees were against it, but not God. Not God. Listen to what God said in Deuteronomy 23, 25. This is truth right here. Deuteronomy 23, 25. God said to Israel, if you go into your neighbor's grain field you may pluck a few heads of grain by hand, but you may not harvest it with a sickle. That's what God said. So, if you're traveling and you're hungry, like how many of you, when you're on a road trip, how many of you, all you want to do is snack the whole way? Right? Isn't that true? I get so hungry when I travel. I'm not doing anything. I'm just sitting and driving. God says, if you're traveling, now in those days people walked, so we're talking some serious cardio here. So if you're traveling and you're hungry, God said it's, it's okay to go into someone's field, pluck a little bit of grain with your hands. Now, don't go in with a tractor. Just pluck some grain by hand and eat it. Deuteronomy 23, 25. Tell me, were the disciples doing anything wrong here in Mark chapter 2? No, not according to God's truth. But according to the Pharisees' traditions, those disciples were lawbreakers. The disciples were doing what was allowed according to God, but not according to the Pharisees. Which, by the way, this is now like the fourth thing the Pharisees have against Jesus. The Pharisees, in the Bible, in the Gospels, Pharisees are always mad. They're always mad, always looking for a fight. But, you know, that's a legalist for you. Legalists are always trying to find fault in everybody else. Legalists love to point out things in other people's lives, never in their own. You know, for the legalist, uh, the more confrontation, the better. So we're, we're two chapters into Mark, and this is confrontation number four. Number one was, was in the beginning of Mark chapter two when God uh, said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees were all up in arms because Jesus said he could forgive sin, and that's something only God can do. Number two was when Jesus had lunch over at Matthew's house with all kinds of other tax collectors and sinners. The Pharisees were so offended by that because they said to be righteous, you have to separate yourself from sinners. Number three, we looked at this last week, Jesus' disciples didn't fast as much as they did. The Pharisees fasted two days a week. That was their tradition. Meanwhile, God commanded one fast a year on the Day of Atonement, so the disciples followed God's law, not the Pharisees' rules, and the Pharisees were mad. And now here's number four. The Pharisees get into it with Jesus because he and the disciples aren't following their rules about the Sabbath. So they were saying to Jesus, verse 24, the Pharisees were saying to Jesus, which, think about it, the Pharisees must have been following Jesus to be able to say something to Jesus, right? They were dogging his steps, which means, which means 
wouldn't they be traveling on the Sabbath? Interesting. They're breaking their own rules because I'm pretty sure they went more than 3,000 feet. They took more than 1,999 steps. So, so why is it okay for them and not okay for Jesus? Legalists are like that. They're, like, they're always right. Everyone else is wrong. See, you, you have no excuse for your sin, but a legalist always has an excuse for his. Legalists hate everybody's sin but their own. Now, in this case, the disciples weren't in sin. The, the Pharisees thought they were because they weren't in step with their traditions. But again, tradition is not the same as truth. Not even close. You know, you, you may have grown up in a church where the tradition of the pastor was to wear a suit and a tie on Sundays. And that is fine. That is okay. But to say that all pastors who don't wear a suit and tie on Sundays are wrong, well, that's wrong. Because, because where is that in the Bible? See, tradition is, is, is not on the same level as truth. You may have grown up in a home where the tradition was to go to a Christian school. And that's fine. Christian school is great. But to say that all parents who send their kids to public school are wrong, that's wrong. See, you have a tradition, and, and not everybody else has to prescribe to it. The tradition in your family may have been to sit around the TV every Sunday night and listen to the Gaithers sing, you know, gospel hymns and, and gospel songs, and that's fine. In fact, I did that with my parents growing up. Sunday nights were really long at my house. But, but to say... To say that those, those good old gospel songs and hymns are the only songs that should be sung in worship. Listen, you're, you're elevating tradition over truth. Okay, nowhere in the Bible are we told that in order for a song to be Christ-exalting and God-honoring, it's got to be before a certain decade. Right? And fortunately, we as a church, we have moved way past that, and, and we're not going back. We are not going back because to go back to that, to honor your tradition over God's truth, that will put you in direct confrontation with Jesus Christ, just like the Pharisees. Again, notice the confrontation, verse 24. And the Pharisees were saying to Jesus, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Not lawful according to who? The disciples were plucking a little bit of grain on their journey, which is what God's law said they could do. The disciples weren't violating any law, just the Pharisees' traditions, and the Pharisees were so offended. Listen to me, we cannot, we cannot get more upset at Christians who don't hold to our traditions than we do at Christians who are not walking in the truth. Right when I um, years ago, when when I came here as a youth pastor, we put the cafe in the teen center. Right, this was years ago. Right after that, many of you who were here then, I don't, I'm not sure if you are aware of this, but right after we put the cafe, we became known as in other religious circles from other churches. We became known as the church with the bar. What? That's Pharisaical. It's legalistic. Call us out if we're preaching heresy, not because we have a cafe. If a, a Christian is going against God's truth and they're living in sin, get fired up about that. But if they're doing something that goes against your tradition, your preference, lighten up. Leave it alone. Do not put tradition on the same level as truth because it's not. And, and furthermore, you're not the authority on truth. God is. And he wrote a whole book about it. The Pharisees thought they were the final authority over the Sabbath day. And that's why Jesus is going to remind them, guys, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. You don't tell me what you can and cannot do on the Sabbath. I'm Lord over it. Legalists think they have the final say on what's true. Legalists think they're the final authority on what's right. Legalist issues isn't with the rules. They love the rules as long as they get to make them. Well, God's already made them. 
And we cannot, we must not add to them and then judge everybody else on how well they prescribe to our extra rules. That is the essence of legalism. One of my commentaries defines legalism this way. Legalism is taking your traditions and preferences and imposing them on others as an act of spiritual superiority. And guys, where there's legalism, this will always be the end result. It's these three things. Number one, legalism destroys. Legalism destroys because it breeds death instead of life. Number two, legalism distracts. Legalism distracts because instead of looking to Jesus and His work to make us righteous before God, we look to ourselves, to our work. And number three, legalism deceives Legalism deceives because it it makes us think that we're better than we really are. Legalism is always looking at and, and calling out other people's shortcomings, never your own. Legalists constantly look for what's wrong in people's lives so they can condemn. They never look for what's right in someone's life in order to encourage Legalists focus on the behavior instead of the heart. Again, legalism distracts. Legalists say, we're better than all those people who drink and dance and swear and smoke. Again, legalism deceives. Legalists say, you gotta, you got to use this Bible translation. you got to sing these hymns. you got to dress this way. you got to give this amount. If you do, God will love you and you'll go to heaven. Again, legalism destroys. That is the result of elevating man's tradition over God. God's truth. It destroys people, it distracts people, it deceives people, all in favor of truth? All in favor of truth? See, listen, this is why we teach the Bible the way we do, verse by verse, line by line. I'm not standing on any soapbox this morning. I'm standing on the Word, God's truth. This will be the foundation of our church. This will be the centerpiece of our service, not some flimsy tradition or petty preference. Say amen if you agree. Okay, good. I'm glad to hear that. We are not in the business of producing religious phonies. We are to be making true disciples, and we must, must, must use God's truth to produce true disciples. Jesus said in John 17, 17, that we are sanctified by the truth, and then he says God's word is truth. What's truth? Okay, this is it. So we elevate this over and above man's tradition. Okay, listen, the second we get that backwards is when we careen off into legalism, and legalistic churches are dying churches. They're churches full of distracted, deceived people who are on the broad path that leads to death and destruction. Religious phonies, they elevate their tradition over God's truth. Here's the second thing. Religious phonies care more about petty customs than showing compassion. Religious phonies care more about petty customs than showing compassion. So Jesus and his disciples, they're traveling on the Sabbath. They're hungry. They pick a few heads of grain to munch on. And, and, and you got the Pharisees all upset because Jesus and his followers are not following their Sabbath day customs. See, the Pharisees don't care at all that the disciples are hungry. The Pharisees aren't the least bit concerned for their well-being. All the Pharisees care about is making sure everybody follows their rules. They were basically saying, we'd rather see you starve than break our rules. No compassion at all. So Jesus said to them, look at verse 25. Jesus said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him? So Jesus starts off with this. Have you Pharisees even read the Bible? you got to know that was a bold statement to say to a group of people who memorized the Old Testament by age 12. Jesus knew these guys read the Bible. What he was saying is, well, if you guys are supposedly experts in Scripture, how come you don't know what it says? 
How come? Because, guys, we've already established that the Pharisees were too preoccupied with tradition to see the truth. And so what I love about Jesus is he, he completely ignores all their stuffy rabbinical discussions with all their stupid footnotes. Jesus wastes no time on their rigid traditions and petty customs. And what Jesus does is he takes the Pharisees straight to the word. Jesus takes them to 1 Samuel chapter 21. So this is, this is when David is on the run from Saul. David is the, the uh, anointed future king of Israel. Saul is the current king. Saul is jealous of David and is trying to kill him. So David has to get out of Jerusalem and he runs to the city uh, northeast of Jerusalem. The city is called Nob. And it's, it's tucked away on a mountain. Uh, Nob is known as the city of priests. And so David, he shows up at a priest's doorstep. He's hungry. He's tired. The only thing to eat is the bread of the presence. I mean, you can almost cue the angelic chorus in the background, right? The bread of the presence. Oh. The bread of the presence were 12 uh, uh, freshly baked loaves. So, like, when I think, I think of Taboon's bread. Like, how, how good is that? 12 freshly baked loaves, 12 loaves representing the 12 tribes of Israel. The bread uh, was set aside for God as an offering. It was put in the holy place of the tabernacle. And there the loaves would sit for a full week until the next Sabbath. When the week was over, the old bread was given to the priest to eat, and 12 new loaves were brought out and placed in the tabernacle. Okay, does that make sense? All right, it's kind of weird. You know, if I'm a priest, I don't want to eat week old bread that's been sitting out that but you know oh well the, listen the only ones who were allowed to eat the bread of the presence it was the priests so here comes david and his mighty men they're they're exhausted from their journey they go to a priest the only food available was this bread in the tabernacle it's the special bread that that no one but the priests were allowed to eat the priest knows what the custom is he knows but he sees david in need and he takes the special bread, and he gives it to David. Now, if you're a Pharisee, what's your reaction? <gasps> right? That's not right. What you did there, not right. Guess what? Uh, God must have been okay with it, because the Bible does not record any discipline, punishment, consequence for the priest or David. And so Jesus brings up that story with the Pharisees who were so angry that Jesus would allow the disciples to break their customs so they could get a bite to eat. Here's the point Jesus is making. Compassion is more important to God than customs. Compassion is more important to God than customs. I mean, think about it. If it was okay, if it was okay for the priest in 1 Samuel 21 to make an exception to the ceremonial law in order to meet an urgent human need, then it's for sure okay for Jesus, the great high priest, to completely ignore the Pharisees' extra-biblical traditions to meet the needs of his disciples. And what's interesting, in the, in the situation with David eating the bread of the presence, the only one offended by that was the evil King Saul. And in this situation with the disciples plucking heads of grain on the Sabbath, the only ones offended by that were the evil Pharisees. And, and just as King Saul was seeking to take David's life, the Pharisees are now seeking to take Jesus' life. Now listen to me. Like that, like that legalist at my childhood church who went up to that visitor. You know, that visitor, again, I, I can still picture her. She was alone, intimidated, Nobody greeted her. Nobody sat down next to her. She felt completely out of place. And instead of showing compassion, that crusty man checked his manual on dress code. Your outfit is not up to code. Leave. No compassion. Was that man on the side of the Pharisees or on the side of Jesus? Pharisees. And who do the Pharisees belong to? Jesus said in John 8, 44, that they belong to their father, the devil. 
If you're solely interested in protecting your own petty customs and extra biblical rules and there's no compassion for people, no kindness, no gentleness, no understanding or acceptance. If, you know, if your mindset is, is wear a longer skirt or leave, you're a Pharisee, a religious phony. Here's what God wants, and, and I don't, listen, I don't presume to decide for God what He wants. I'll just tell you what God wants from His own mouth. Hosea 6.6, 6, I, the Lord God, desire compassion, not sacrifice. Does God place the emphasis on customs or compassion? Compassion. Now, let me just preface this. It's not that customs or traditions are bad. You know, some of them are really good, but, but when protecting and preserving your traditions is more important to you than loving and serving people, that's a problem. That really is a problem. When, now, let me say this. When it, come to, when it comes to God's truth, right, when it comes to God's truth, we don't budge. We don't budge on this. But when it, when, when it comes to man-made traditions, do you understand that there's room to disagree? We can show tolerance and acceptance. Again, when it comes to God's truth, conviction, conviction, strong conviction, but when it comes to traditions and customs, acceptance. Here's the key. In all things, love. Okay? All men will know that we are Jesus' disciples if we wear dresses and suits. Is that what the Bible says? Okay, how about this? All men will know we are Jesus' disciples if we play the organ and sing hymns. Is that it? No. All men will know if we're Jesus' disciples if we preach KJV only. Yes or no? No. What's the Bible say? John 13, 35, all men will know we are Jesus' disciples if we what? If we love one another. Okay, we got to get this right. We have to get this right. It's compassion over petty customs. Religious phonies are completely upside down. They care more about petty customs than showing compassion. They elevate their traditions over God's truth. And here's the third thing. Religious phonies turn divine blessings into dreaded burdens. Religious phonies turn divine blessings into dreaded burdens. So we have to, we have to keep in mind what the Sabbath was for. Remember what it was for? It was a, it, it was a time to rest and be refreshed by the Lord. It was a time to just stop your work and and worship God. Focus on your relationship with the Lord. One day out of seven was was to be set aside as a time of renewal for your whole being. Of course, rest would renew your body and worship would renew your soul. That's what the Sabbath was for. But the Pharisees, you know, they had their enormous checklist it's kind of like when you're grocery shopping. You know, sometimes uh, I, I get to take my kids with me to the store, right? And the first thing my kids want to know, always the first thing they want to know is, how long is the list? And if the list is like a scroll, you know, you just roll it out and it just keeps going and going, my kids are like, ugh. Now, I see it as an opportunity to just be with my kids. You know, we get to spend time together. But if there's this big, long list, my kids see it as a burden. The Pharisees had a big, long list for the Sabbath. Here's all the things you can and cannot do. It was a scroll. And instead of of people looking forward to the Sabbath and being excited about it, instead of seeing it as an opportunity to just be with the Lord, to spend time with Him, the people now saw the Sabbath as a burden. You know, the Pharisees pulled out their, their, their list, and the people were like, ugh. And so Jesus confronted the Pharisees for taking this blessing from God and turning it into a horrible burden. Look at verse 27. And Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man. You know, Psalm chapter 8, just real quick, Psalm chapter 8 says that God, God knows our frame. He remembers that we're dust, right? God knows what we need. And what we need 
is rest and renewal and refreshment from Him. And so God instituted the Sabbath for our good. I mean, it's, it's a blessing from God to us. Jesus says, verse 27, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So here's what we, here's what we work really hard to give you at this church. We work really, really hard to give you grace and truth. Grace and truth. John chapter 1 says that Jesus was full of grace and full of truth. He's our example, okay? So at this church, you will hopefully receive grace and truth, not rules and regulations. See, guys, people are built up in a grace and truth environment, but people are weighed down in a rules and regulations environment. Listen, as a pastor, I really want to see you grow through grace and truth. Nah, I don't want to see you be strangled by rules and regulations. Now, let me, let me say this. Does that mean, as a church, does that mean that here anything goes and we can just do whatever we want? Is that what I'm saying? No, I'm not. God's Word, the truth, sets the boundaries. Okay, this book tells us what goes, what we can and cannot do, but we're not going to add anything to it. When we do, that's when legalism starts to creep in, and we know what legalism results in. Deception, distraction, death. I don't need to review those points with you. You get it. Compassion and truth. Listen, compassion and truth is what we're about, not customs and traditions. Can you agree with that? Can you get on board with that? Look at verse 28. This is the last verse. Jesus says about himself to the Pharisees, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again, it was God who decreed the Sabbath in Genesis chapter 2. God designated one day out of seven to rest. God did that. So for Jesus to call himself Lord of the Sabbath, what, what is he saying? That he's God. Jesus is saying, I created the Sabbath, so I make the rules. Again, remember what I said earlier, the Pharisees' issue isn't with the rules, it's who makes the rules. And the Pharisees prided themselves on being the rule makers and rule enforcers, and Jesus is like, out with your rules, I say what's right because I'm God. See, what Jesus was doing here is he was tearing their whole man-made, works-based, rule-driven, legalistic system down. He was tearing it down. The Pharisees' religion, which was Judaism, like I said earlier, their biggest day was Sabbath day. The seventh day of every week was the day to showcase their legalism. John MacArthur says, what God established as a day of reverence toward him and refreshment from work, the Pharisees transformed into a day of stifling regulation and restriction. I mean, how many of you have been to a church and you could feel the oppression? Have you ever been to those churches? I've, I've been to churches where, where I've sat there and there's no freedom, no joy, no excitement, no energy. It's just burdensome, dull, drudgery. Jesus is not in those churches. Because the verse I brought up last week, Psalm 1611, in the Lord's presence there is fullness of joy. Now, I've, listen, I've been to some churches that were full of negatrons. Churches full of critics. Churches full of judges. There's only one judge, and that's Jesus. And He is the Lord of the Sabbath. He makes the rules, and He alone, as there is no higher authority. And if Jesus has said it in His Word, then that should settle it in our minds. There's nothing we can add to make it better. The minute we add our own rules and traditions and customs, that's when we take this day, the Lord's day, and we turn it into a burden instead of a blessing. And, and guys, that's what religious phonies do. Okay, they elevate tradition over and above truth. They are more concerned about petty customs than showing compassion. And they take divine blessings and turn them into dreaded burdens 
Let's have none of that here. Let's do none of that here. Here at this church, listen, here at this church, it's truth over tradition. It's compassion above customs. All right? Let's be a blessing, never a burden. Pray with me. Father, thank you again for our time together in your word. I thank you, God, through your word for showing us what you value, what you want from us, what you see as important. God, I pray that we would model ourselves based off of what you have told us in your word, that we would care more about what you've said more than uh, the way we've always done things. Truth is greater than tradition. God, I pray that if people um, that we see and that we know, if they don't think exactly like us or, or act exactly like us, God, they're, we're all different. We're all unique. And Lord, I pray that when we don't see eye to eye on preference or tradition, God, that we would still show compassion on the major things, on what's true, on your word. Yes, God, we, 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 we can't budge and there needs to be conviction, but on the minor things, on preferences and tastes and styles and traditions and customs, we can, we can show acceptance. We don't, we don't have to break fellowship over those things, but God, I pray that in all things, we would just love one another. That we would consider others' interests as more important than our own. God, I pray that at this church, we would be about grace and truth because that's what Jesus was about. He was full of grace, full of truth. I pray that we would not go to one side or the other, but we would stay right in the middle, grace and truth. God, help us with that. On our own, we're going to sway. So God, keep us where we need to be, work in our hearts, continue to... Uh, uh, allow us to be a church that values truth over tradition, compassion over customs. I pray that we would not be legalistic. The second we become legalistic is the second we start dying. So God, keep us from that. I pray that we would never fall away from grace and truth. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.